Thanks, Jane. You're watching Southeast today. Our top story tonight. Left traumatised parents speak out about maternity services in Tunbridge Wells after a damning report. The staff involved don't really have an understanding of the impact it has on families going forward. A huge emergency response in New Haven with migrants taken to hospital after being found in the back of a lorry. A life sentence for murdering his two-year-old daughter, Jan Galami, will serve a minimum of 23 years for killing Zara. We'll bring you all the details on that sentencing with Nick at Maidstone Crown Court. The hottest tickets in town. Fans queue for Maidstone's fifth round FA Cup match. Love, love me do. You know I love you. And the greatest mystery in rock and roll turns up in a Sussex attic. Sir Paul McCartney is reunited with his stolen guitar. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Ellie Crissell. Mothers endured emergency caesarean section delays and suffered unnecessary blood loss on a Kent maternity ward, according to a health watchdog. The Care Quality Commission has published a series of damning reports on all three maternity services run by the Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells NHS Trust after an inspection last year. The maternity services at the Tunbridge Wells Hospital received the lowest rating being deemed inadequate. Today, a number of parents have told this programme they've been left traumatised after giving birth at the hospital. Hannah Rowe has this report. Delays in treatment and poor leadership are shocking statements to hear about a maternity service. But for a lawyer who's worked on a number of cases filed against the trust, the report's findings are expected. It really doesn't surprise me. Unfortunately, I've got too many cases against that trust. Um, people who've had their lives absolutely turned upside down. You read that improvements are being made and that lessons are being learnt, but from a personal experience and also on a professional basis, I just don't see that. Mark's first son was born at Tunbridge Wells Hospital in Pembury, an experience his wife says was so harrowing she couldn't face repeating it. He lost over 10% of his birth weight. Um, windows weren't able to be opened in the hospital and, and they'd run out of fans. Um, so the experience after birth in particular was, was quite traumatic for us. To, to the extent that um, you know, I really felt very strongly that I didn't want to return to the hospital um, to give birth to, to our second and third sons. So we made the decision to have home births. Naomi's not alone. This is eight-year-old Edie. She has cerebral palsy and her mum Marianne will have to care for her for the rest of her life. When she was pregnant, Marianne felt the baby stop moving and came into Tunbridge Wells Hospital. She says no one listened to her concerns. Our daughter had a few massive drops in heart rate. We had to go and find the midwives to get them to look. Um, and then that was just completely disregarded. And then eventually a C-section happened, but that was after we'd been in hospital for about five hours. Um, and basically all of those delays just contributed towards Edie's brain injury. The CQC have issued a warning to the trust and outlined the areas they must improve. Staffing pressures, um, the, the pressures around making sure that they've got really strong governance arrangements in place um, and that then supports the staff at the front line to be able to deliver high quality care. In a statement, the Trust told us that providing the highest levels of maternity care is their priority and that since the inspection they've taken steps to address all of the recommendations, the majority of which are now completed. But for Marianne, it's too little, well too late. These things happen time again. Um, and I think as well, the staff involved don't really have an understanding of the impact it has on families going forward, because our lives will never be as they should have been. Are you wave? Hannah Rowe, <laughs> BBC <laughs> South East Today. Well, there were calls for nationwide action to be taken to improve safety and care for mothers and their babies within the NHS following a previous damning report into East Kent's baby death scandal. A review into East Kent Hospital's trust conducted by Dr Bill Kirkup in 2022 found at least 45 babies might have survived with better care. 
Last year, England's healthcare regulator told BBC News that maternity units currently have the poorest safety ratings of any hospital service it inspects. BBC analysis of Care Quality Commission records showed it deemed two-thirds, 67 per cent of them, not to be safe enough. The Department for Health and Social Care said £165 million a year was being invested in boosting the maternity workforce. Well, let's speak now to our health correspondent, Mark Norman, who is outside the Tunbridge Wells Hospital in Pembury this evening. Hello, Mark. As we've just been hearing, this is just the latest in a whole series of negative headlines about maternity services in the South East. It's depressing, isn't it, Ellie? You mentioned the Kirkup report looking at East Kent, and that detailed extensively problems around poor staffing levels, poor staff training, problems with fetal heart monitoring, and crucially, problems not delivering compassionate care to parents in maternity departments. And yet here we are hearing it all again at the Hospital Trust behind me. Now, that Kirkup report was sent to every hospital in the country. It was sent here. It would have been read here by senior leaders, and they should have implemented everything that was in it. Yet clearly here we are again hearing about problems in maternity and some of the horrible stories that Hannah just gave us just now, Ellie. And what about those parents who might be watching at home, expecting to use these services over the coming weeks and months? They're going to be worried. Yeah, one mother today told me she was reeling at the prospect of having to give birth to her baby here later this summer. Interestingly, though, the Care Quality Commission, the same inspectors who produced this report, just a few days ago published their patient survey into maternity services. It details every hospital trust across the country. This trust did quite well in terms of patient response and their reaction to some of the care that they'd received. But clearly, the trust really need to sort this out quickly because they have to keep parents confident in the services that they're provided. They say they made changes. That's yet to be proven, of course, Ellie. Mark, thank you. There was a huge emergency presence at New Haven Port today after a number of migrants were found in the back of a lorry on a ferry. Sussex Police, the South East Coast Ambulance Service and East Sussex Fire and Rescue Service were all called to the scene. Two men have been arrested as six migrants were taken to hospital. Claire Starr has more. A major emergency response. Ambulances, police and border force all on scene in New Haven and the air ambulance brought in to help. Migrants were discovered in the back of a lorry on board the Seven Sisters Ferry. It would have been a journey of at least five hours across the channel. New Haven's MP says the French authorities normally have a good track record of stopping migrants getting onto lorries in Dieppe. They'll be very disappointed this happens, uh, and we want to make sure that as the small boats are tackled, that this doesn't become a route of entry for people who want to get here illegally. The ferry operator DFDS said immediate medical attention was provided to the migrants when they were found on board and authorities were contacted with the crew following their instructions. Six people have been taken to hospital for treatment. No deaths have so far been reported. One man has been arrested on suspicion of people smuggling and a second suspected of entering the UK illegally. Both are in custody. The port remains open and ferry services are running as usual. The Home Office says that while the incident is ongoing, it would be inappropriate to comment further. Claire Starr, BBC South East Today. Emergency services are at the scene of an incident in Tunbridge Wells. The air ambulance, police and forensics were called to the scene this afternoon at Cafe Nero in Royal Victoria Place. Officers remain in the area. Farmers who staged a go slow around the port of Dover say they're expecting a large turnout as they escalate their protests this weekend. Tractors blocked the roads in protest at cheap food imports last Friday. The government says it firmly backs British farming. The adoptive father of a two-year-old girl has received a life sentence after being found guilty of murdering his daughter. Jan Galami will have to serve a minimum of 23 years and his partner Rokia Galami was jailed for two years for child neglect. Zara Galami suffered serious head injuries in May 2020 at their home in Gravesend. The judge said Galami's attack was a culmination of the brutal and brutish way he treated female members of his family. Family. Nick Johnson was in court. Two-year-old Zara Gulami, described in court as bright, bubbly and intelligent, murdered 
by her own adoptive father. Jan Galami slammed Zara's head against the wall at their home in Gravesend in 2020. It wasn't until some hours later a family friend dialed 999. Ambulance service is the patient breathing. Uh, he, uh, it's, a, it's a little latent cell, it's about one and a half years old. So he said the, the brain is something soft or something, something. His head is broken, that's it. So yeah. the, pa the patient's broken their head? That's what he said. At Maidstone Crown Court today, Jan Galami was jailed for life and has to serve a minimum of more than 23 years. Zara's mother, Rokia Galami, sentenced to two years in prison for child cruelty. The judge, Mr Justice Wall, said Galami may not have intended to kill his daughter, but this fatal attack was the culmination of the brutal and brutish way he treated the female members of his family. He described Mr Galami as an intensely selfish person who only thought about his own welfare. Following Galani's brutal attack on his daughter, he concocted a false alibi by taking his son to a local supermarket to buy an ice cream. At the time, the judge said two-year-old Zara would have been lying on the floor at home, fighting for her life. It's been a very long and difficult journey. Um, what was going through my mind is Yangal Army has refused to accept any sort of responsibility from day one um, and constructed a false alibi that took numerous investigative time to deconstruct with phone record analysis, CCTV analysis and witness statements. And today, the court finally fulfilled the last part of the jigsaw and delivered justice for us. Sentencing Rokia Galami, the judge said he accepted she lived in an abusive relationship and didn't directly harm her daughter or approve of her husband's violent behaviour toward her. But the judge said, you ensured her suffering by failing to alleviate her pain and not putting right her injuries. Investigating officers concluded that Zara was betrayed in the most brutal way. Well, Nick joins us live now from Maidstone Crown Court. Hello, Nick. What was the reaction in court today? Well, both Jan and Rakia Galami were in the dock some distance from each other, listening to everything through an interpreter. Jan Galami, dressed in a grey tracksuit, remained largely emotionless throughout, except when the judge was give, delivering his closing remarks on Galami's personality. That's when he began muttering loudly, drawing his hands across his face. Rakia Galami, dressed in a black suit, a black headscarf, kept her arms folded throughout. Now, we know that the pair adopted uh, Zara from Afghanistan before moving to the UK. And recently, we've heard from the NSPCC in the last hour, who said they've been devastatingly, Zara's been devastatingly let down by those who promised to care for her. Ellie. Nick, thank you. A new scheme to help keep people healthier for longer has been rolled out at two GP surgeries in Seaford. The 12-week pilot offers free gym memberships and classes to patients identified as having mildly elevated blood pressure. Working in partnership with a leisure brand, the aim is to provide an alternative to medication and intervene before it's too late, as Anissa Kadri reports. So hold foot on the step as you step up, stand tall. Stepping up their keep fit regime as a result of a simple phone call. I felt um, very enthused because I thought it was a minor miracle that the GP practice was actually calling me. Um, access to, to GPs is very pressurised here in the area and I was very uh, encouraged that they'd actually got in touch with me and identified me as someone who might benefit from this pilot programme. We'll do a nice and simple programme but you just want to keep it nice and simple to start with. 17 patients from two surgeries in Seaford are taking part in this pilot to improve health and well-being at Downs Leisure Centre. The patients are patients that have been identified as having mildly elevated blood pressure, so not the really high uh, blood pressures that would be dangerous to leave and, and wait, um, but those people that have uh, slightly elevated so that we can try and make some intervention other than just medication to make a difference. Shall we move the lever up a little bit? Yeah, that's okay. Lovely. So the traditional route would be that um, the patient would go to the GP and the GP would say, oh, you could do with some physical activity and you'd give, it, you'd, you'd give them a telephone number. Okay, And we know that we lose a third with that approach. The difference is now the GPs are reaching out to the individuals 
making contact to say this programme would be ideal for you and then giving us the contact details of the patient in order that we can then make contact to bring them onto the programme. We've talked about salt and we've talked about food labels and how to identify salt in your diet. There's um, nutrition support and free classes as part of the pilot um, with programmes designed for each patient. As soon as they asked would I, would I like to take part, I said yes, absolutely, definitely. My weight has stayed the same but certainly my, the fat level has gone down so I'm, I'm actually healthier that way. It's clear patients being offered these classes as part of this 12-week pilot want it to continue and those involved say they're looking into how to fund it long term. We would like to be able to sort of go bigger and better and sort of reach more people, more people with more lifestyle interventions, that's what we'd like to do. The aim is to keep people healthier for longer and offer these services on a larger scale. Nice Cardry, BBC South East Today, Seaford. It's creeping up to 10 to 7, a reminder of our top story tonight. Mothers suffered unnecessary blood loss and emergency C-section delays on a Kent maternity ward. A damning series of reports by the CQC left maternity services at Tunbridge Wells with the lowest inadequate rating. As parents said, they'd been left traumatised. Also in tonight's programme. Love, love me do. You know. Love it, he does. So Paul McCartney is reunited with a stolen guitar after it turned up in a Sussex attic. And a bit of a weather sandwich this weekend. A dry start, a dry end, wet in the middle. I'll give you the full menu later on in the program. Well, FA Cup fever seems to have gripped the town of Maidstone this morning. James was there, weren't you, James, queuing for tickets along with all those eager fans? Absolutely, there's supposed to be uh, two ticket sales windows. There was only one because tickets sold out by lunchtime for one of the biggest matches to be played in Maidstone United's history. They face Coventry in the fifth round of the Cup later this month. 4,800 tickets were on sale in total and they were gone within hours after excited fans started queuing overnight. From the early hours today, queues were forming for the hottest ticket in town. They had thousands to sell, but this is the game of a lifetime for Stones fans. They weren't taking any chances. Got it at 6 o'clock this morning, yeah, it's been good having a chat. Yeah, just talking about the game, looking forward to it. Players just started coming in, so we're cheering them on. Fair play to them, look. I hope they get their tickets. It's going to be uh, a great game, great occasion for the club and, uh, yeah, especially. For those further back in the queue, it was an anxious wait. I didn't realise the queue was going to be this big this, this early. You know, the, the chance of getting sick and getting slimmer by the, uh, by, the, by the back of the queue. And things didn't look good when at 10.15 the gates were shut. Okay, we're just trying to work out how many we've got left, who we can get it to, and obviously we don't want to let anybody down that is coming down here at such early hours of the morning. But there were still hundreds left as the queue started to clear. Even the late arrivals emerged with smiles on their faces, tickets in their hands. So I live in Winchester in Hampshire now. So I've been queuing up in the sun with my mates, got our tickets, and we're all happy, ready to go. Yeah, queuing for two hours, so it was all worth it. We got our tickets. <laughs> See, this is the magic of the FA Cup, not being at the front of the line, you know. Some people's got to hold the back of the queue. And then, you know, winning against all odds and getting tickets, that's what the FA Cup's about, so... <laughs> <laughs> the final few went to Elsie, who'd got a taxi here to get one for her brother Ellis. Thank you. Thank you. How do you feel? Your sister got you the very last ticket. Good, I think. Yeah, yeah, good. I feel like it could be a bit more grateful. <laughs> like, but it's all right. You better give me money back, though. Tickets sold out. A good payday for the non-league side. Maidstone United's Cinderella story continues. I hope she gets her money back. Uh, Maidstone's game away against Taunton tomorrow has been postponed after a pitch inspection today. Uh, they want their next game next week rescheduled, or they'll play on the Saturday in the league before facing Coventry on the Monday. So no news on that yet. In the Premier League, uh, this Sunday, Brighton and Hove Albion are away against Sheffield United. Uh, the women's team play Liverpool at home in the Women's Super League. Uh, meanwhile, in League Two, Gillingham are gearing up for their next game with a playoff spot in mind. The team are set to play Newport County on Saturday, hoping that a win will keep them firmly in the running. The players say promotion is still not out of the question. It really is that important time of the season, you know, where you have to pick up them points, and there will be, two, there'll be some teams that go on a run, and um, I don't see why that can't be us. Um, with the squad we've got down there, I feel like we can push on. 
and this is the right time to push on now and um, pick up the points. There's no time for talking anymore and we just need to deliver. Also in League Two, Crawley Town host Forest Green Rovers at the Broadfield Stadium tomorrow. Uh, both of those League Two matches are on at three and BBC Radio Kent will be providing full live match commentary on the Jills game on FM and DAB. So that is the sport this weekend, Ellie. Lots of sport this weekend. Thank you, James. Now, he's the co-creator of the Royal Family and wrote for television classics including Mrs Merton, Coogan's Run and Dr Terrible. But he is best known for his poetry. Henry Normal has founded two poetry festivals and he's appearing at the Delaware Pavilion alongside fellow poet Brian Bilston tonight. Ian Palmer has been to find out more. 9291246. Whose number is that? It's Mary. What, you've been ringing Bloody Mary next door? If you shouted, she could hear you. The regal humour of Henry Normal. The writer and television producer was sovereign in relation to the success of the royal family. The first episode took two hours to write and it just fell out of us because all the things that our mums and dads had said were, were there, were stored in us, and, and of course they'd say them again and again. And the great thing is that uh, other people would see him and say, oh, my dad says that. My name's Paul Calf, uh, support Man City, uh, like drinking, like a laugh, chat. You know, the BAFTA award-winning writer has worked with the actor and comedian Steve Coogan for more than 30 years. <laughs> he used to arrive in his uh, Porsche uh, and he'd bring my milk. So for a while, I had the fastest milkman in the West. Uh, um, but because I knew him so well, when we started a company together, I could guess what his reaction was. And, and as Steve said later on, that, that saved him a lot of time. <laughs> Tonight, normal service will resume when the Sussex-based writer begins his poetry tour at Bexhill's Delaware Pavilion. Nervous? Uh, I am a little bit because um, we don't usually do poetry uh, gigs this big. I mean, this is a, it's a big place, do you know what I mean? And uh, very often you think of the word uh, poetry crowd as, uh, you know, uh, juxtaposition of terms, don't you? Uh, um, uh, but uh, people have come in out to see us and it's great. Those lycra shorts that they make you wear. <laughs> there's, been, there's been a lot of fuss about those, haven't there? Do you think they're making a, a mountain out of a mountain? <laughs> Caroline Ahern worked with the Sussex writer for many years before her death in 2016. He remembers her with love and affection. In May, Normal performs his poetry at the Brighton Festival. As he prepares to go on stage this evening, we leave the last word to him. It's a love poem, uh, as we've just had Valentine's Day. It's called, My Heart Will Not Be Shushed. I fell for a librarian. I asked her to be mine. I said, my love for you is overdue. And she said, fine. Ian Palmer, BBC South East Today, <laughs> Bex Hill. Oh, I'm not sure how to follow that. Well, it's been dubbed the greatest mystery in the history of rock and roll. So Paul McCartney's bass guitar used on Beatles hits, including Love Me Do, was stolen from the back of a van in 1972 in West London and then it disappeared. Now, more than half a century on, it's turned up just a few miles from his home in someone's attic in Hastings. Miranda Shunker explains what happened. Love, love me do. You know I love you. It was Paul McCartney's first Hofner bass guitar and featured in their debut single and video for Love Me Do back in 1962. But after buying it in Hamburg for £30 the year before, it disappeared at the height of their fame, presumed stolen out the back of a van. Until now, after a global appeal, a family in Sussex said they had it. They've come forward with images of, of a bass that was in their loft and they've said, this, we've, we've got this guitar. And, and from there, obviously, people have spotted that it's, it's the guitar and uh, it was collected the next day. It's been inspected by Nick Voss from Hofner, who's the world's leading expert on violin Hofner basses. And it's now been confirmed that this is Paul McCartney's original Hofner bass. Researchers found the guitar had ended up being sold on to a West London pub landlord before making its way to Sussex and staying with the same family for the last 50 years.
the actual moment when we heard that the bass was back and that the bass had been confirmed as as the bass, I mean, they're, they're moments you never forget. And um, uh, we've heard that Paul McCartney is thrilled. He uh, There's a statement on his web page now, on, his, on, on the website now, saying how much he appreciates, you know, what... Uh, everyone has done you know to get this base back and 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 it's just it's just a great great end to a great great search love, love me do. the guitar hasn't been valued but could well be worth around 10 million pounds now an expensive mystery solved Miranda Shunker BBC Southeast today love me do. An incredible story. Time now for a look at the weekend weather. John Hammond is with us, and it's a bit of a, a weather sandwich, isn't it? Sure is, yes. <laughs> uh, that's what I said earlier on, isn't it? And uh, the weather is going to chop and change through this weekend. It started off pretty well, didn't it? This morning, beautiful blue sky. It felt like spring. Actually, Ellie asked me earlier on, is spring here now for good? Well, no, it's not, but there's no sign of anything particularly cold on the menu, though it did cloud over a little bit this afternoon. It stayed dry. But it ain't going to stay dry through the weekend. Reasonable start on Saturday. I think we'll see uh, some mostly dry conditions. Then the rain arrives with a vengeance on Saturday night. Very wet indeed. Bit of a question mark about how quickly it dries up on Sunday. But yes, a weather sandwich. Dry start to that sandwich then this evening. Patchy cloud, that cloud coming and going. There will be some clear sky overnight and that will allow temperatures actually to fall lower than we've seen for the last few nights. Probably not a frost, but three or four degrees in some rural spots. So uh, a fresh old start. Some early brightness, particularly across parts of East Kent, but the cloud will tend to increase. The breeze will slowly pick up as well. We'll have the odd spit or spot of rain by the end of the day, but I must stress that through daylight hours, most of us will stay dry. Yet another mild one, 12 or 13 degrees. But then the fun starts as we head into the night. This really active frontal system is going to push in from the west, and that's going to carry quite a lot of rain. And given that the uh, ground is still pretty wet, hence the concern from the Met Office and the yellow warning. Some very heavy rain through Saturday night and into Sunday as well. Here it comes in. Quite a splash. If you're heading out on Saturday night, you'll need something waterproof. Now, how quickly does it clear away? Question mark. We're not quite sure yet, but I think eventually it will clear through and something a bit brighter will follow on another mild day. So that's the way the weekend ends. Beyond that, pretty unsettled again. Further fronts coming in off the Atlantic. So a sort of showery look to things through the early part of next week. Now, there are hints that it could turn quite a bit colder later on next week. Watch this space. Uh, ahead of that, though, some rain, some shine and temperatures for several more days to come still in double figures. Not too bad. Thank you very much, John. That is it from me and from John and the rest of the team. Uh, Miranda Shunker, though, will be back with your late news update at 10.30. Bye bye.